Great. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us and taking the time today um, for this virtual presentation about Skeena Salmon, climate change, and what you can do. Uh, we're hosting today's webinar from the territories of the Kitsilis, Kitsum Kalem, as well as the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Uh, my name is Julia Hill, and I'm the Operations Manager for Skeena Wild, and I'll be facilitating today's session. Um, we hope that, hope that you're all doing well and managing okay during these, uh, these challenging times. So uh, I think it's safe to assume that many of you have joined today because of your interest or concern of climate change impacts to Skeena Salmon. Um, so as part of today's presentation, we'll be discussing the challenges and impacts that Skeena, Skeena and North Coast Salmon are experiencing or, or will likely experience due to climate change. Uh, the importance of maintaining their diversity, and we'll explore some of the data uh, that supports that. Um, and then also we will uh, touch briefly on what we are doing as an organization um, to deal with some of these issues and also what you can do to help ensure their success into the future. Um, so first we're going to hear from Skeena Wild Executive Director Greg Knox and then from our Science Director Michael Price, um, who's currently working on his PhD um, at Simon Fraser University. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll be touching on some of the data from his research. and It's a complex story of Skeena Salmon um, that's emerging um, and it's incredibly fascinating, but, but please note that this is new research. Um, so it's hot off the shelf and some of the results have been published, um, but some have not. And so we ask um, that you not share these graphs as, as the analyses are, are still ongoing. Um, and so after today's presentation, we'll open up for the remainder of the hour for questions and comments and discussion. If you wish to ask a question directly to Mike or Greg, please use the raise hand function, which is a button located at the bottom of your, the toolbar of your screen. Uh, if you'd prefer to use the Q&A function, please do so. I will be prioritizing and grouping your questions as they come in. We'll do our best to get to them all. Uh, please refrain from using the chat function to ask your questions. Um, and if we can't make it to your question and, and you'd like to follow up, please send us an email, reach out, and we'll do our best to get um, some answers for you. Um, and, and if people are interested in staying on past the hour, um, uh, we, we can do so to ensure that we get to your questions. Also, we are recording today's presentation, so if you missed something, you'll be able to find uh, the links to our archived uh, presentations on our website. Uh, so before I pass it over to Greg, um, I'm going to just post a quick uh, polling question to kick us off today. Um, and I will just do this now. There are two questions. The first question is, are you experiencing climate change impacts where you live? And the second question, which is multiple choice, uh, is what types of impacts are you seeing? So we'll just give you 30 seconds to answer those questions. I will relay the results back to you before we get started. Okay, just a couple more seconds here. Okay, I'm just gonna end this poll. And share the results. So 100% of you are experiencing climate change impacts where you live. Um, and I'll just let you peruse um, the impacts that folks on this webinar are witnessing. Um, no climate change deniers on today's call, good to see. Um, <laughs> most of you are experiencing increased variability in water levels in the rivers, which I think is, is something um, I definitely I'm also seeing, many of us are. So I think I will pass it over to Greg, um, and thank you again, everybody. And uh, so Greg's going to give a short presentation, Mike's going to, um, do his bit and then Greg will wrap things up before we start the uh, discussion component of today. So I'm going to shut off my screen, but I'll be in the wings 
um, if you have a question for me. Go ahead. Great, thanks, Julia. So good morning, or I guess afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to uh, participate in this. We have quite a lot of information for you today, so it's going to take a bit of time to get through it. And we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, if we need to go over the hour, we certainly can do that. So uh, we, will, uh, we will do our best to, to be succinct. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I have been uh, doing salmon conservation in the region, Northwestern BC, for close to 20 years now. And I've been with Skeena Wild Conservation Trust for thir almost 13 years. And uh, in recent years, I've been putting more energy into researching and trying to understand impacts to uh, salmon from climate change. Um, so. This is uh, a bunch of that information. And, and as Julia said, Mike will uh, update everyone and talk about his important research, which really provides a lot of insights and information in, in terms of how Skeena salmon have been um, reacting to the environmental changes and other changes. So I first wanted to start by just giving folks a quick overview of a, you know, the life history of Skeena salmon because it's important to understand this to understand what is impacting them uh, through their lives. So of course they start, this is the Skeena watershed here. Uh, they're born in, in one of the tributaries of the Skeena or the Skeena itself. Uh, they spend, some species like pink and chum will go immediately down to the estuary. Uh, other species like uh, Chinook and Coho and Sockeye will spend anywhere from uh, a few months, but most of them spend a year to two years in fresh water before leaving. Then they head out to the mouth of the Skeena, which is here, and the Skeena Estuary near Prince Rupert, Port Edward. And they spend anywhere from a, a few weeks to a month or more uh, feeding, growing. Uh, and adjusting to the ocean to from freshwater to saltwater before they head north along our coast and up towards southeast Alaska. And from there they make their journey up along the coast so this is the southeast Alaska here and uh, out into the North Pacific and they spend anywhere from one to four years feeding in the open Pacific in the North Pacific. Uh, some species go further, like Chinook and Sockeye. They go almost as far over as, as Russia. Uh, steelhead as well can do that. Uh, chum kind of have a medium range. And pink and coho stay a little closer to home, to shore, but they're still out, out in the open ocean there. So, um, and of course, once they're done, they're, they're feeding and growing in the, in the North Pacific, then they return back to the Skeena. So the, the Skeena is a big system. It's, it's, a, it's a massive area, uh, watershed the size of the country of Switzerland. And we have the six species, if you include steelhead and over 300 individual populations. So they're, they're, they're quite, um, they're very diverse and each of these populations has slightly different life histories using slightly different habitats. And um, so there's a lot of, of complexity and variability and climate change is impacting them across their whole lives in these variety of environments. So it's quite, quite um, variable and certain uh, populations will be impacted differently because they're using slightly different environments. This is just a summary of the life cycle and the salmon life cycle and how they're impacted through their life cycle. And I'll, I'll get into more of this in, in detail and, and so will Mike, but uh, basically, when they're young, they can be impacted by floods or, or uh, warm water. Um, when, they're, when they go out to the ocean, they can, an estuary, they can be impacted by warmer temperatures um, and changes in food. And then, of course, when they come back, 
low flows, warm waters, those sorts of things can have significant impacts on them. So I wanted to uh, just give people an overview of what we're already seeing here in the region in terms of climate change impacts. This is information from the, pro the provincial government. Uh, they did a synopsis of information in 2016. This is from that report. And uh, this is our region up here. Uh, and we've already seen about a two degree warming over the past hundred years in, in the region here in the Skeena watershed. It's a little less on the coast, but uh, for most of the watershed, we've experienced about two degrees warming. And most of this is actually coming in the winter time. Uh, we've, we've experienced about a 14% increase uh, over the past hundred years in precipitation. So it's become wetter generally here. And the, uh, the, the f freezing, the, the, the first day of melt in the spring is happening about a week earlier than it used to happen. And this, this, this specific data is since for between 1945 and 1993. It's actually, the more recent information I've seen is it's actually about two weeks. We're, about, we're seeing the, the melt in the spring happen about two weeks earlier than it did about 100 years ago. So some significant changes. And of course, on, in the fall, we're seeing it stay warmer longer as well before it freezes up. This is uh, some information on uh, sea level change. And this is Prince Rupert. It's, uh, the sea level has gone up about 13 centimeters over the last 100 years. And all this information I just showed you is uh, current up till about 2013 or 14. And of course, in the past six or seven years, uh, we've experienced even greater changes in terms of climate change. So generally we've been seeing more extreme weather events. They're becoming more common. Uh, glacial, uh, glaciers are receding. Uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with seeing the red trees, the mountain pine beetle outbreak. This is the outlet of Maurice Lake uh, near Houston. Uh, heavy mountain pine beetle infestation there. This uh, increased uh, forest fires. This is uh, near Houston as well, a forest fire near Houston a few, few years ago. So we've also been seeing uh, some significant uh, rain events in some years. This is 2017, where we had some really big, two really big rain events, which blew out a lot of our rivers. And this um, had some significant impacts on, uh, this, was, this happened just after our salmon had spawned, so it flushed out eggs. Uh, of course, it brings a lot of silt and mud down, and those can cover over the eggs suffocate them. It also changed a lot of the spawning habitat in some of the rivers as well. And, uh, and when, after the salmon spawn, of course, they die. And those nutrients are important for the river systems and the young salmon in those rivers. And this water can flush those nutrients out really fast. Uh, in 2017, we also saw a lot of landslides. This is the Claw River in the Upper Copper. Uh, they added a lot of silt and debris into the rivers. And um, that has similar problems in that it changes and chokes out spawning gravels, impacts water quality, and uh, can change the, the rivers themselves. And there were a lot of these uh, landslides in 2017 with the, with the huge rain events. And I spoke to uh, a creek walker who counts salmon out on the coast. He's been doing it for 40 years. And he said he'd never seen anything like it. There were, there were landslides uh, all over the coast that year. It's also not only high flows, but low flows. And what we've been seeing in a lot of the recent years, and this is only to 2016, but these are what you call, the, uh, call a hydrograph. It's a graph of the water level. This is Skeena River at Usk, just above Terrace. And I, my, what I want to point to is this red graph um, in this period of late August and September. 
nor this this green level is the highest on record and the blue is the lowest on record and in this late summer early fall in many of the last several years we've had almost record lows in in august and september in in the skeena river and uh in 2018, we had low flows. We had record four droughts, uh, level four droughts, all the way into uh, November that year. So some significant changes. And why this is important is because if that water's really, in, really low in August and September, that's when the salmon, the adult salmon are returning and spawning. And that can have uh, impacts. It can delay when, how they're swimming up the river when they reach the spawning grounds because the hold in deeper water uh, increases their vulnerability to fisheries because there's less water, they're more concentrated, and the warm temperatures can have impacts on their migration, especially when it gets above uh, 16 degrees. And uh, once it gets to 18 to 20 degrees, it can be uh, seriously uh, harmful and even lethal, especially above temperatures of 20 degrees Celsius. Just a couple photos. Uh, skiing at really low levels in 2018. Uh, some side channels where a lot of fish died because uh, the water levels dropped, they dried up and stranded fish. And these are uh, a couple photos from Babine Lake where a lot of the sockeye were stranded in ponds. Uh, they, and this one's of uh, the Kitwanga River. It dried up in areas where the Gitney had never seen it. The elders said they'd never seen the river go dry in these places before. Um, and this had a lot a big impact. It, uh, even beaver dams built dams across the Kitwanga River that had never seen that before. And so it, it really uh, impacted the access to spawning areas, increased significantly increased predation from eagles and bears, wolves and increase the stress on these fish. Another concern is when the water temperatures get warm and you have a lot of salmon together, um, it can increase disease outbreaks. And we haven't seen much of this in the Skeena yet. Uh, in the, it's happened in the Babine several times in, in the Babine Lake. Uh, but it's relatively uncommon here. That's something we're concerned about in, in terms of the future. Uh, if, if the temperatures are warm, that could increase the disease outbreaks. And this has been an, a, a big issue for Fraser stock guy. A large percentage of them die every year before they make it to the spawning grounds due to warm water stress and uh, sometimes disease outbreaks. Another thing that we've been seeing is lower snowpack in, in many years. And this is a, a map from the BC River Forecast Center. And what they do is they look at the snowpack and they map it out through the winter and, and spring, summer. And if you look typically in June, it's a good indicator of how much snow will be available into Jul July, August, and September. And in recent years, we've had really low snowpacks in the Skeena Nass area. Uh, this is as of June last year, it was only 16% of normal. And that means less water in the rivers and potentially warmer temperatures into that uh, time period of especially August and September when our salmon are spawning. Uh, so it can, can increase a lot of stresses on, on our fish. We've also been seeing receding glaciers. Uh, this is the Bear Glacier uh, near Stewart. If you, if you guys have driven between uh, Mesiaden Lake and Stewart, you, you'll, the high, this is a picture from the highway on the bottom. On the top, same. And you can see how much it's changed in a little over 50 years. This is 1958 and this is 2015. So uh, our glaciers are, are melting fast. And this um, can have serious impacts on salmon because glaciers provide a lot of cold water in, in that August and September time period. And that can really help um, mitigate if we have low snowpacks, for example. Uh, those, those cold water inputs are important. And once 
those glaciers are gone, they could potentially, uh, they, they will uh, significantly change, those rivers will be changed. They will no longer have that major glacial input. And so that can have an impact on salmon. And of course, our salmon here in the region have adapted to those glacial waters uh, over time. And so they'll have to adapt again. In some systems, they might actually become more productive because the water warming up could mean more food availability in the lakes and rivers that with less uh, kind of cold glacial input. So it could have mixed um, impacts on salmon, some good and some bad. Uh, in terms of the, the, the estuary, so this is the mouth of the Skeena River. Uh, you'll see this is Port Ed over here, Lilu Island, Flora Bank. This is our salmon come down the Skeena River. There's hundreds of millions of them in the springtime right now, actually, is when they're all migrating down the river. And they spend time here uh, adjusting from that fresh water to salt water and feeding. And this environment's also been changing a bit. This, it's uh, warming up. Uh, if you look at the lighthouse temperatures along the BC coast, we've been having more warm water in recent years that can change food and predators. Uh, this is some work that was done by the World Wildlife Fund, uh, looking at potential changes into the future. And what they found was, was a general warming trend in the near shore water near Prince Rupert and Port Ed at the mouth of the Skeena River. Further out in the ocean, we've been seeing a lot more warm water conditions. And between 2013 and 2016, we had a really warm water event. Uh, and it was, the scientists had never seen this before. They nicknamed it the blob. And it was two to three degrees above normal, which may not sound like a lot, but it can have significant impacts on food and nutrients and, and also predators. This is uh, in 2017, this is again another uh, sea surface temperatures in the North Pacific. Here's Haida Gwaii here, Prince Rupert here. Uh, it cooled, the North Pacific cooled off in 2017 and into 2018, but then it, it's warmed up again in the last year. And this is uh, the temperatures in December. And this is the most recent month. This is April. Uh, still very warm out in the North Pacific where our, our adult salmon are, are currently feeding. And as I mentioned, this is important because it impacts food and prey. These, this, these are called uh, zooplankton. They're little tiny shrimp creatures. And when we have normal cold water in the North Pacific, we get these larger species of zooplankton. And you can see they have a lot more fat in them. This kind of amber color, goldy color is, is fat. When we get warmer water, like we have now, uh, two deg three degrees above normal, we get these smaller species of zooplankton with a lot less fat content in them. And that this salmon eat these zooplankton, but also the fish that salmon eat eat these zooplankton. So they're the basis of the food chain out there and uh, can have a huge impact on the number and of salmon we see return and the size of the salmon that we see return. As I mentioned, it, it also impacts predators. In recent years, we've seen warm water species showing up off the BC coast and Southeast Alaska. Uh, species like yellow, yellowtail tuna, uh, anchovy, mackerel, some of these species actually uh, eat salmon quite prolifically, like uh, mackerel will eat salmon. So it's just showing us that there are, are other changes going on there, on out there with other fish and, and uh, new um, predators showing up in bigger numbers on the BC coast at, in some years. So I'll just, before I hand it over to Mike, I want to talk about kind of projections that we'll likely see, uh, a couple climate models. This is from the Pacific, uh, the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium, a group out of the University of Victoria that does climate modeling for British Columbia. And they're predicting uh, by 2050, another two degrees warming, approximately, in British Columbia. 
Uh, this is actually specific to the Skeena region. Increase in precipitation, especially in winter, plus 9%. Snowfall, uh, a slight decrease in winter for snow, but a big decrease in the spring snow melt or in spring snowfall, uh, minus 56%. Uh, and then <coughs> some potentially good news for food growers, farmers, uh, more days of growing, longer growing season and uh, frost free days. And then this is some work that was done by uh, a group of scientists in Alaska, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, Montana. And this projects out to the year 2080, and they're pro projecting anywhere from 1.7 to 5.5 degree temperature increase. And this depends on the climate models, how much, how much uh, carbon dioxide and other climate pollutants we're putting out there over that time. Uh, snow decreasing, like as I mentioned, mostly in the springtime, and precipitation increasing. So, going to hand it over to Mike now to talk about how uh, Skeena salmon have been reacting to these changes over the last hundred years, and uh, a bunch of the uh, the research that Mike's been doing. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Uh, and thanks all for um, attending today. Is, is everyone able to see the screen? Hopefully, okay. Greg, are you able to see it? Fine. I assume yes. Um, yeah. And I don't see your screen yet, Mike. Oh, do you not? Oh, yeah. Okay. Hard on. There we go, how about that? Yeah, that's great, Mike. Okay, apologies, technical difficulties. Um, yeah, as Greg mentioned, uh, yes, I'm science director with Skeena Wild. I'm in the midst of a PhD, hoping to finish off uh, early next year, if it all goes well. And um, really the basis of my thesis is trying to understand um, a historical context for salmon, salmon in the Skeena. Um, really to understand, you know, how abundant, how diverse, how productive these populations were historically so that we can get a better sense of how much we've lost, um, but also how able they are to persist into the future. Um, and while Greg spoke quite generally about salmon uh, across species, my research is focused on sockeye. Uh, the main reason is, you know, they are the most data rich species. They've been the, the most um, marketable fish for commercial fisheries. So we've collected the most data for them. So all the data I'm going to show pertains to sockeye, but um, I think it's fair to assume that all, pop, uh, all um, Skeena species have uh, undergone similar um, changes over the last century. Um, and so this first slide really just shows you know, over this last 150 years of industrial development in the Skeena, we've seen considerable changes to habitat. So this particular figure breaks down every sub-basin within the watershed and um, uh, quantifies what we call a human footprint score. So um, looking at various pressure indices, uh, and the highest sort of human footprint, the highest impact on habitat is in the red zone and uh, those uh, uh, at the lowest end are in blue. And some of these indices are, you know, railway and highway corridors, it could be agriculture or forestry development, um, mining, etc. So we do see the largest impacts along the lower uh, and mid Skeena really following that railway and highway corridor up past Terrace uh, and through Smithers and into the Fraser. Um, so again, you know, this is just for historical context. These are potential habitat impacts that we've seen in the watershed. Certainly for salmon specifically, commercial fisheries have been operating since 1877, which uh, literally caused um, 
uh, direct mortality of fish, but also can create some selectivity pressures, uh, which I won't really go into um, today. Um, but just to say that um, uh, research began uh, on salmon in the Skeena in 1912, and it was really in response to conservation concerns at that time, specifically on sockeye. So they collected um, scales from fish uh, caught in commercial fisheries of sockeye beginning in 1912 and running till 1947. And, and these data provide the basis of all the data I'm gonna um, quickly show you now, but will be uh, providing a more in-depth look into my research in, um, in two weeks time. I'll be giving a virtual presentation, noon hour presentation, same day, but in two weeks and an evening presentation on the Thursday. So if you're more interested in these data or my thesis uh, chapters, you can look into that. Um, but uh, in general, these data show us um, a number of uh, fish returning to the Skeena. So here's just the number of sockeye in, in um, thousands returning to the Skeena since the beginning of commercial fisheries up to 2018. And you see they do um, vary over time. They have these periods of high abundance and then they uh, also have these periods of low abundance. Um, but when we're actually trying to assess the changes in wild fish abundance, um, we see slightly different patterns. So the black lines here uh, are wild fish abundance over time. And the gray lines are those fish that have been um, artificially enhanced. So for those unfamiliar in Babine Lake, which has historically been the largest producer of sockeye in the Skeena, uh, three spawning channels were built by 1970 and they've been producing fish ever since. So now the Skeena, Skeena sockeye, even though we're, we've seen a return of abundances similar to historical levels, uh, it's important to realize that 70% of all sockeye now returning to the Skeena are uh, produced from spawning channels. So the actual number of wild fish has declined considerably and they've declined across all populations. Oh, uh, and, and this uh, loss in wild fish abundance um, really translates to a loss in population diversity. So if we separate, um, uh, and I'll get into this very briefly later on, we're able to, to separate populations of sockeye into 13 population complexes. One of those is babine. And the other 12 we can think of as non-babine populations. So those are in orange. Babine is in blue. And historically, you know, these non-babine populations, these tributaries such as the Balkley or the Kispiox or Lake Els populations, you know, they contributed up to and beyond 50% of the overall numbers of sockeye returning to the Skeena. Whereas nowadays we're down to about 90 to 95% of fish are from the babine. So only about five, five to 10% on a given year of sockeye returning to the Skeena are from these um, non-babine populations. And this loss in population diversity uh, is really akin to those assets in a financial portfolio um, where, where at one time we had many baskets of fish, we uh, now have all our eggs in a single basket known as babine. Um, and at the watershed level, this loss in population diversity has really translated to a spatial contraction in their distribution. So even though not returning to the skin on average, similar to what it was, historically, so this is the change in abundance from the historical period to the present period. Uh, we see the a large abundance, really no change in abundance along the main stem Skeena up to uh, Babine River. It's this loss in abundance from wild populations from all the individual tributaries uh, that translates to a loss in fishing opportunities for indigenous uh, and local communities, but also a, a loss in salmon provisions to local ecosystems and wildlife. Uh, we can think of diversity also from what 
Greg had mentioned in what we call life history or life history expressions. So these are, you know, a given life history expression. Just here are depicted the various life histories of fish. They could spend uh, F is and green is for freshwater. At a freshwater age, they could be spend one year in freshwater or two or three years in freshwater. O is the ocean years. Some fish, some sockeye actually go straight out to sea uh, and spend two or three years in the sea. And then S is for spawning. So these various uh, life histories expressions buffer um, the total Skeena aggregate, like those individual assets in a financial portfolio, from varying environmental conditions. Uh, and while we see uh, quite a variety of different life histories, for sockeye in particular, there are these four age traits, we call them. And the first number, one or two at the beginning, just represents whether they've spent one year in freshwater or two years in freshwater. And the second number is the ocean year, whether they spent two or three years in the ocean. And so when we look back over the last century and how these four main age traits or life history expressions have changed, uh, we see uh, a higher proportion of fish in the recent period leaving freshwater after one year. So whereas in the early period, we saw uh, upwards of 25% on some good years of fish spending two years in the ocean, sorry, two years in freshwater. Now we're down to, at, in some years, less than 5%. So what that means is in any given year, you have up to 95% of fish leaving at the same time. And if there's a, if they meet four ocean conditions, whether that's, uh, that is those blob-like uh, ocean warming conditions that can be unfavorable for, uh, for that generation of salmon. Uh, and sorry, and just, just to say too, this change in uh, sort of these fish leaving after one year in fresh water instead of spending two or three years in fresh water, it could be because we're seeing more ice-free days on at freshwater lakes, so they're, um, uh, these, some of these nursery lakes are actually becoming um, more uh, productive over time. But also it's definitely influenced by the number of fish now rearing in a single lake, which is Babine Lake. Um, it could be a combination of climate change and enhancement. Uh, but we also see in terms of these life histories, if we combine uh, their ocean years, whether they spend two or three years in the ocean, we see an increase in the number of fish that are spending three years in the ocean. So we're seeing uh, these fish spending longer at sea. And this could be uh, a reflection or their response to um, uh, increased competition with hatchery fish. There's a lot more hatchery fish in the ocean. In fact, there's a recent study uh, that showed there's more fish in the North Pacific, rearing in the North Pacific across uh, all salmon producing nations than uh, ever in the, uh, at least since 1925 is as far back as they could take it. Uh, or it could be a response to those warming ocean conditions, limited food out in the ocean, less energetic prey that they're consuming, but the end result is they're spending longer at sea and the longer they spend at sea, the uh, the more their survival decreases, their overall survival decreases. Uh, in terms of growth, uh, so each of these dots it, uh, represents the mean growth. These data have been normalized, so they, it's just uh, comparing growth in a given year to the overall mean growth over the entire time period. So in any year, if a dot is above the red line, it means they're uh, growth is above average. If it's below that red line, it's below average. And looking at these fish, this here is for all fish that during their second year in the ocean. Uh, it's really interesting in this early period, they uh, obviously had a, a, a higher than average uh, stage of productivity. And then you get into the 1930s and 40s and they hit a really low period uh, in productivity. That productivity has uh, returned, uh, although uh, it's worrying over this recent period, we seem to be declining again into this low productivity phase. 
and we're obviously not sure where the bottom is going to end and we start to come back up. So it has been variable over time, but we're in this, um, what seems to be a low productivity phase. And here again, this is just for the third saltwater growth year and a similar pattern uh, displays itself at least over this recent period. You know, the last two, four, six years in the time series uh, is below average. Um, in terms of sort of good news or optimism, uh, Greg had touched uh, very briefly, and uh, I think he's going to touch a little bit more on that. But again, just looking at these growth data here, it's just for that first year in fresh water. Um, interestingly, and I won't have time to get into it, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but that similar declining trend over that historical period exists where in the 1930s and 40s was really a tanking of productivity in fresh water. Again, this is a response to their environment. And this is across all populations. This recent period has stabilized. So growth has in uh, general has been above average in fresh water. So hinting that uh, the productivity of rearing lakes has likely, is likely improving and may continue to improve with climate change. Though it does depend on the population. So here I've just separated out one population. This is Bulkley, so primarily rearing in Maurice Lake. It's a deep lake, glacially dominated, cold, generally considered unproductive. And remarkably, again, we see that decline in the productivity, at least reflected in their growth in that early period, but really a rise to above average growth uh, since 2000 or since the mid 90s really. Um, again, hinting that some populations like the Bulkley, uh, Bulkley sockeye, Maury sockeye uh, may, you know, um, yeah, may become more productive in time. Another sort of good news, if I can leave on some good news, I didn't get into this, but looking back in those historical scales, one of the first stages was to identify a scale to population, right? These scales were from um, sockeye caught in commercial fisheries and uh, they represented multiple populations. So the first step was to send these scales off uh, to the genetics lab and they came back as showing 13 population complexes. They're all numbered here, but really the take home message is those 13 population complexes uh, that showed up historically, they remain today. So we haven't lost any of these major population complexes. In terms of life histories or these life history expressions, uh, there again in these scales, uh, 10 uh, major life history expressions were expressed and we still see these 10 life history expressions um, or these 10 life histories expressed today. So I guess to end, uh, you know, we have observed a, a significant loss in the abundance and diversity of wild populations in the Skeena. Um, they still retain the fundamental building blocks uh, for these fish to adapt to changing uh, environmental conditions. Uh, so again, if interested in uh, a deeper dive into these data, uh, I'll be given a, a more full, fulsome presentation uh, in two weeks time. So with that, I'm gonna switch out uh, to Greg. Uh, and hopefully we'll get into a fair discussion or some answering of questions. Great, thank you, Mike. So, yeah, I just wanted to finish with a, with a few uh, pieces. <clears throat> One is what Mike was talking about is I guess this fundamental question, will Skeena salmon be able to adapt to the changes that we've been seeing and, and will likely come at us in the coming years and decades? And, you know, someone who dives fairly deep into this stuff, I have a lot of hope. Um, salmon are incredibly resilient creatures. <clears throat> 
I mean, basically, human as humans, we've been trying to throw everything we possibly can at them. We try to harvest as many as we possibly can. Uh, we, you know, degrade their habitat, impact their habitat on an increasing level. We uh, put things like fish farms in their way, uh, potentially causing issues like disease and sea lice infestations. Uh, we pump out uh, billions of hatchery salmon into the Pacific, North Pacific every year, about 40% of the salmon in the ocean are from hatcheries to compete with our wild salmon. Um, so we're throwing a lot at them. So if we, if we kind of give them a chance, our salmon are incredibly resilient and they will uh, likely bounce back and, and rebound, um, especially once conditions start to improve. And this was seen in the coho crisis in the 1990s. Uh, we were harvesting a lot of those coho. We backed off on the harvest and coho bounced back. They're now doing fairly well. Um, <clears throat> as Mike mentioned, our skein of salmon, are, we have a lot of diversity in life history, genetics, different habitats that will respond to climate change differently. Some could become more productive. Our northern location is really helpful uh, in that we will likely to have cool water temperatures into the future, uh, especially compared with more southerly systems like the Columbia or Fraser, which are a lot warmer. Um, and we're already seeing some interesting changes. This is uh, some research that's been done in uh, Glacier Bay, Bay, Alaska since 1977, looking at how salmon have been colonizing the rivers there after the ice melted, after the glaciers melted. And what they've seen is all species of salmon have, have now come back and, and um, are using those streams, spawning in those streams, have colonized them all within 40 years. And pink salmon showed up within 10 years of glaciers retreating. So salmon, yeah, are incredibly resilient and these changes can happen quite quickly. I mean, if you imagine uh, here in the Skeena where I'm sitting in Terrace, we used to have an ice sheet about a kilometer high above my head only 10,000 years ago and it melted over thousands of years and salmon only showed up here, you know, maybe 6,000 or 8,000 years ago. So. Uh, they're incredibly adaptive creatures. Also, closer to home, we've been seeing changes. This is uh, Strunk Creek in the Nass watershed. This is uh, Mesiaden Lake. In the past, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Gitneyal Fisheries, uh, didn't see very many sockeye at all spawning in Strunk Creek. But in the last few years, they've been seeing huge numbers of sockeye showing up and spawning in Strunk Creek. Uh, they think because it's it's warmed up a bit, so it's become the conditions have become right here, and uh, it's now be becoming one of the major sockeye producing systems, spawning areas in the Nass watershed. So it's, it can happen extremely qu quickly, and we're already seeing these changes. So just wanted to mention a few things that things that Skeena Wild is, is doing. Um, Mike's research has been really important. He's been uh, researching into how salmon have been changing over the past hundred years using these scale samples. Uh, we've been help working with uh, indigenous partners on rebuilding plants for at-risk sockeye populations and to rebuild them and, and working with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and looking for uh, funding to help rebuild those populations. Uh, we provide a lot of input into the annual fishings plans for the North Coast, uh, supporting selective fisheries that can select out the strong populations from the weak ones. Uh, protecting critical salmon habitats has been a really big part of our work. We uh, put a lot of effort into protecting the Skeen estuary, especially in recent years, but also uh, understanding impacts from mining and forestry and trying to improve those, those practices. Uh, and we've also been participating in Pacific Salmon Commission to try to reduce Alaskan interception. And we've had some success in, in recent years uh, with Skeena and Nassaukai. So lots of work to do, but um, some, some good success. And uh, we're gonna keep, keep on doing what we do. So 
just a few points on, on what you can do. Uh, people who are who care about skiing of salmon or salmon in general, uh, the first thing is be active. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you like to fish, try to target the stronger populations, species, and uh, back off on, on the ones that aren't doing as well. And you can look at information in season, like the tidy test fishery information, or we have a fishing app, Skeen Wild Fishing app, which shows you graphs of the strength of the returns as the season goes on. So uh, I, that's really important or just try not to take as many fish, or if pink salmon are doing well, maybe take a few more pink salmon or coho salmon. Uh, use your voice, sharing information, talking with your friends and neighbors. It's important that people understand the challenges that salmon face and what we can do to protect them. And so it's really important people become informed or else um, we're not going to do very well at trying to protect these fish. And then finally, supporting conservation. There's a lot of good groups out there, uh, both provincially and, and locally. So support those groups in, in your community who are, who are working on conservation and be, get involved with them. Um, so that's, that's really important. So I'll just end on some, a few sources of, of information if you're interested. This is a link to uh, the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, 2020 outlook for BC salmon stocks and also they talk a lot about environmental conditions in the province and what's going on. Uh, really good information. And then this is uh, some other information. This, uh, is, this one's called 54 degrees north climate chronicles. It was put together by Nikki Scoose and Smithers. Uh, interviewing folks about different impacts of climate in the Bulkley Valley area and beyond in the region. And so there's an episode specific to salmon, but there's, there's I think, seven or eight episodes altogether. Really informative. Um, CBC did a really good uh, podcast. It's on their website. It's called 2050 Degrees of Change. There's, uh, one, I think, the first episode is specific to BC. So it's, it's really well worth uh, listening to. And then the Pacific, Sign and, uh, Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium is a group of scientists out of the University of Victoria, and they have been doing climate projections and, and putting together climate, inf climate change impact information for the entire province. So that's another really good source. So with that, we would like to now open it up to questions. And I, I know there's only five minutes before one, but we'll, we'll, keep, uh, we'll keep going for another 15 or 20 minutes before we wrap it up if, if uh, people have lots of questions. Great, well, thanks guys um, <clears throat> for this uh, informative uh, presentation. Um, so we've got the first question. Um, one, I think Greg, you, you, you were touching on um, and, and is a, possibly a shorter answer. And the second one is, I think will be directed to, to Mike uh, from um, somebody asking what, ap that, what adaptation strategies can communities along the Skeena do to sustain populations but continue to harvest if possible? Yeah. Um, Good question. The adaptation that needs to be done is we as communities need to try to have a better understanding of the health of the salmon runs in season. So that I mentioned the tidy test fishery, that's a, a, a test fishery that happens at the mouth of the skeena. It gives us in season information. But there's other fisheries programs. Uh, the wetsuit and marker capture program in Morristown, there's a, a Gidney Isle fish fence, there's um, a fence in the upper Sustat, there's, there's different programs out there that are looking at salmon populations in season throughout the watershed. And so we as communities need to be looking at that information and adapting our catch. So if you live in Smithers, for example, and you look at the information, um, on coho in season, if, if they're doing healthy, then by all means, you know, it's, it's appropriate to target those fish. 
But uh, if they're not doing so well, then as communities, we need to try to back off on them. So I think this is something we've been working with DFO to get more in-season information so that, and, and get, the, get it out to communities. And I know the Skeena uh, Fisheries Commission has been doing a lot of work here as well, um, trying to uh, use Tai more effectively to look at Skeena Chinook and the strength of Skeena Chinook populations in season. Uh, one thing we're going to be doing is doing in season short videos to update people on the strength of the runs as they're coming back so that there's an easy place people can go and find that information. Uh, and then the other thing that communities need to do is make sure that the development we're pursuing is done in a way that doesn't further harm salmon. So with their habitats becoming even more important with climate change stresses. And uh, it's, it's really important that we do uh, uh, development in a way that, that doesn't harm these habitats, especially large scale development like forestry and mining. And we've done a lot of work as an organization looking at the impacts to salmon from those industries. And we've uh, written reports and made recommendations around how those uh, uh, activities like forestry and mining can be done in a way that uh, minimizes impacts on salmon. Great, thanks, Greg. Uh, the next question here is uh, how do you untangle declines due to fishing pressure versus climate and environmental pressures. And this question came up uh, during one of Mike's um, slides um, showing declines of, I think it was babine stocks over time. Boy, untangling anything is always challenging. Um, but as long as we have fairly accurate catch data, then at least you can um, assess what the overall exploitation on those populations is. Um, the challenge with, you know, the influence of climate change or the environment is once these fish reach the ocean, but also when they're in the freshwater rearing lake, you know, it, it is that literal black box and we don't know, you know, it's kind of like looking at the, um, those growth data that I showed. It's something I didn't mention, but uh, each of those points represent uh, a whole number of fish, um, but all of those data are based on the survivors. So we, we honestly don't know how many actually aren't surviving to even become a data point. So I think at least in terms of assessing uh, the impact of fisheries, I think that's a lot more straightforward, but yes, how you tease that apart from, you know, warming ocean conditions and, and how, you know, what, what percentage of the loss in fish numbers is due to the environment, I think it's extremely difficult, you know, not to get too far into it, but, you know, one tool that we can use is hypothesis testing, but it, it all just it comes down to the data that we have. And when, again, these fish hit the open ocean, there's such a, a blank in data that it's very difficult for us to say with any certainty, you know, how much of a driver in environmental change is. So. Yeah, and, and that question's becoming more important with these, these greater changes and variability year to year in the environmental conditions in both fresh water and the ocean and it's that's driving a lot of the research currently so there are more people looking at these issues including mike uh, i know uh, for example department of fisheries and oceans has been uh, working with scientists from russia and the us i think japan to to do more research in the north pacific uh, and they've had a couple expeditions uh, there's, there's more collaboration, cooperation among scientists. Uh, so there's more, there's a lot of gaps in information, but there's a growing effort to try to get a better understanding where those gaps exist. Of course, that takes money and time, so it's not easy. 
the ocean, the North Pacific is a really big place. Uh, it's not easy to understand. And even the lakes, you know, like Babine Lake and that, it's not easy to understand. There has been more recent um, studies of changing environmental conditions in Babine Lake though. Uh, so, um, yeah, ongoing challenge, but hopefully we'll be able to fill some of those gaps over time. Yeah, so, and sure, just to touch on that, not to um, you know, go too far down on this question, but yes, it really, again, depends on the information that we have. If we had better information on the number of fish leaving the Skeena and a better handle on the number of fish that are returning to the Skeena, at least then we can tease apart, sure, how many fish are actually, you know, what proportion are not making it. So really it's a, um, an estimate of marine survival for individual populations. So that, that is sort of a proxy for environmental influence. Um, and those data for most populations are simply not there. So we could do a lot better job in acquiring the necessary data to start answering these questions. Thanks guys. Um, we don't have any other questions. Uh, we have a comment here from uh, Sabina. She says, stand our ground and protect the environment. Be present when bodies and voices are needed in all aspects of health as the interconnected nature of corruption needs to be dismantled on all levels. Thanks for your, your comment and your passion. Are there any other questions before we wrap up today? Again, you can use the raise hand function um, if you wanted to ask a question directly. Okay. You're gonna have to unmute, unmute yourself, Edward. Hello. Um, I've actually got about six questions, so I'll probably end up just sending an email, but one thing I wanted to uh, really quickly clarify was, uh, um, there was a slide that was shown by Greg at the beginning uh, about snowpack and I remember it from the presentations given two weeks ago and it was 16% of normal. Is that a 16% of normal? So 84% uh, reduction in snowpack or is that a 16% reduction in snowpack? Thanks. That's 84% reduction in snowpack. 16% yeah. Um, six, six, okay. So I, I did understand. Not normal would be a hundred percent. Yep. No, I, I totally got you. That is so, absolutely so if you, horrifying. Okay. If you look at the, the maps on the BC River Forecast Center, this year, for example, the snowpack's higher. It's uh, Last time I looked, it was like 86% of normal, something like that. So much more close to normal this year in our region. Further east, uh, east of Prince George, so McBride area, uh, it was something like 123% of normal. So it was a really high snowpack here in the upper Fraser, for example. But just to clarify, the 16% the, the of normal, that was a trend over the course of like three or four years, That just was a few years ago? That was oh, just that the one, one, that was just the 2019. Okay. 2019. I just put a bunch of years up there because it was significantly, no, I think less than 50% of normal in all of those years. And I can't remember the years, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. I think all of those years we had really low snowpacks. Uh, this year, as I men just mentioned, is, is closer to normal. Awesome, thank you very much. Yes, please uh, reach out, Edward, uh, if you'd like to discuss um, some of this information in more detail. Or have I did uh, get your email, Edward, so it's going to take a bit, a little bit of time to answer your questions. I totally understand that. It's yeah, uh, there was a lot in there, and unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, you'll get another one of those from me today. So. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, well, no thank problem. You. Thanks for your interest uh, in this stuff. And I, you know, while we're, we're waiting for any additional uh, uh, questions to come in, and before we wrap up, I just wanted to uh, 
just plug um, next uh, webinar that's coming up or, or virtual presentation coming up. Um, uh, like Mike said, it is two weeks from now um, on the Tuesday at noon. Um, and the date of that is uh, June uh, 9th at noon and then another one in the evening on June 11th at 7 p.m. And this presentation will be given by Mike and he will be diving uh, deeper into, into his research. Um, and so uh, if, you, if you are interested in, in what you were hearing today and want to learn more, don't want to miss that. But also please um, share it with your friends, anybody you think might be interested in, in, in learning more about this stuff. Um, yeah, and it, Mike's um, research is really fascinating. He, he has got his hands on one of the largest historical data sets in the world these scale samples that were taken at the canneries uh, starting in 1912 at the mouth of the Skeena River. A massive set of information that was just sitting there for a hundred years and they've, Mike's recently uh, had them analyzed and is doing a lot of work to uh, unlock the mysteries from these samples. So it's quite fascinating research. So I just want to thank you all again for taking the time today to uh, participate and, uh, and learn more about um, what's happening here in the Skeena, what we can do about it. We look forward to keeping the uh, conversation going. Um, we will continue to do more of these information sessions, um, especially you know, in the face of, of COVID and our inability to get out and have um, large, large crowds these days. So um, please, uh, if you have any questions or comments on how we uh, did today and how you think we might be able to improve, um, let us know. We are, um, we're always interested in hearing from you. Um, before we wrap up, we just have a couple of other uh, comments or, and questions that come in. Uh, Edward says, Mike's research is awesome. Thanks for sharing it. Thanks to Skeena Wild for putting this on. Stoked on Thursday's repeat. Right on, Edward. Thanks. <laughs> um, uh, Sabina asks, uh, does the Fraser River landslide affect Skeena sockeye stocks? And maybe we'll... Um, I can... Does the Fraser River landslide affect Skeena sockeye stocks? Um, certainly not directly, and I can't think of any indirect impacts, although there might be. Um, so what Sabina is talking about is there was a huge landslide at Big Bar on the Fraser River that's above Lil Lillouette on the Fraser River uh, last year, last spring, and it blocked the passage of most Fraser salmon going up and there was a huge effort to uh, try to get those salmon above the blockage. Uh, interestingly, crews from here, from the Gixan, Lake Bebe Nation, Shimshin, all headed down there to the Fraser to help corral and get salmon above the landslide. And they were very successful in, in doing that. Uh, thank, you know, they, had, they had a lot of skills using technology to uh, live capture fish and transport them. So um, I know they've done a lot of work on that big bar landslide on the Fraser over the winter. And uh, there's, so we won't, you know, we won't know how effective it is until later in the summer. Um, but uh, hopefully there'll be better fish passes this year. Partially uh, a lot of it also depends on water levels. There is, as I mentioned uh, with one of the questions, there is a lot of snowpack in the upper Fraser. So the Fraser River is quite high right now is my understanding. And when you get the higher rivers, higher flow, that can make things more challenging for those salmon trying to get past that blockage. So, but yeah, the short answer is no, it shouldn't, the Fraser River landslide shouldn't uh, impact skiing and soccer. Great. Okay.
Well, I think we can end it there today. Uh, and again, we'll be uh, carrying out the same uh, virtual presentation on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. So if you think there's somebody uh, that in your life that would like to catch uh, this information, uh, please have them tune in on Thursday. And again, we will also be, um, we are recording today's session and we'll be posting it on our website. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Ed.